Hello. Can everybody hear me? I don't, I don't like podiums very much, so I have a lavalier mic. I'm going to stand in front of the podium. I also don't like PowerPoint uh, or, or name tags. Uh, I do like Coca-Cola. And I like my mom very much. Let me tell you why I start with that. Um, I do work for a company called Eurasia Group. I'm based in New York. I've lived in New York for 30 years. I live in Brooklyn, actually, my wife and I. But I'm from here. I went to high school at Pace Academy about a mile and a half from here. And uh, whenever I speak in Atlanta, I invite my mom to come. And we have an understanding that she's going to sit in the back so that I'm not aware of her. I don't know how it happened, but in this case, my mom is sitting, well, <laughs> here. And I can already see that this is going to be a problem. It's not her fault. This is just where we ended up, so hi, Mom. I'm going to try and look over her while I talk. OK, don't look at me. Yeah. So yes, I'm here to talk about geopolitical risk. I'm going to talk about oil prices. I'm going to talk about China. I'm going to talk about Europe. I'm going to talk about the Middle East. But I think I want to begin by just having us all take a moment to reflect how lucky we are that we live in the United States of America. I don't know how many people stayed up to watch the speeches last night after the New Hampshire primary. But you know, we can't lose because Either Donald Trump is going to be elected president and we're just going to win and win and win some more, or Bernie Sanders is going to be elected president and no one will ever pay for college again. So this is the place to be, clearly. Um, I will talk a little bit about the election slightly more seriously than that after I'm done with the rest of, uh, of the world. And I'm going to leave time for questions, so I hope to leave a good 15 minutes for questions. have no idea how that's going to work. If there's a roving microphone, we'll figure that out. Uh, we'll figure that out later. So first, let me explain Eurasia Group and my role there, because it'll give context to what you're going to hear from me, because I'm not an economist. I'm not a financial analyst. I don't do exactly what you guys do. In fact, I don't at all. Um, I'm an analyst of geopolitical risk. And most of the people who work at Eurasia Group, we have about 70 analysts, have a particular country or a particular region or a particular subject that they focus on and they're expert in. I am like my boss, Ian Bremmer, whose book I think a lot of you have at your tables, his book, Superpower. I'm a global macro analyst, which means I'm the person who talks to our clients, who does presentations like this one, occasionally does media in which I do it around the world. That's what you're going to hear me do now. So it's going to be very broad. Um, I invite questions on anything that I'm going to talk about or anything that you would like for me to talk about. One thing that I'm probably am not going to spend a lot of time up front on is emerging markets. Um, but I certainly invite you to ask me about emerging markets in general or specific markets that you're interested in. But let's start with the price of oil. You can't get much more global than that. Everybody's got an interest in the price of oil. All our clients want to know where oil is going. So we're, lo we're lower for longer. And I mean, the, the, the basic story here is that we live in a world in which now we are chin deep in crude oil. That's the story. Yes, demand has slowed down. China's economy is slowing. There's less oil demand, although, you know, oil Demand continues to grow, but at a slower pace. The real story is supply. And our view at Eurasia Group, I'll just cut straight to the chase for those who are hoping to win the contest next year on oil prices. Our view is that you will see some rebound in oil prices over the course of this year. I think Brent was around $31 a barrel today. So we're looking at more in the $40 to $45 a barrel range on average over 2016. And maybe it drifts toward $50 to $55 a barrel in 2017. Why do we think it will drift higher? Because there is going to be less production uh, in the United States. There is going to be a slowdown in US production in response to the lower price. 
And also because while growth is slowing in China, there's the, there is a likely possibility that later in the year, people will realize that while China is slowing down, it is not slowing down as fast as a lot of people are afraid that it is. I'll talk more about China in a moment. So we're liable to see prices drift higher, $40, $45 a barrel, and maybe a little higher next year. But there is no way, unless there is a bolt from the blue, that we are going back to a world of $115 per barrel, which we saw just in 2014. Now, there are a few reasons for this. Number one, I say we're chin deep in oil. Obviously, the US is producing more oil than ever. Iran is out from under sanctions. Iran is going to be producing four to 500,000 barrels per day additional by the middle of this year. Maybe as much as a million barrels per day more than they're producing now by the end of this year. Iraq is producing more oil. ISIS is no threat to oil production in most, most of the oil production in Iraq, which is taking place in the south of the country to an area where ISIS really has no access. We're even expecting Libya to produce more oil. They'll put together a unity government. It may not last long. Libya will produce more oil. But here's another key factor in why oil prices are not going to go very much higher than I'm talking about. And that is the fact that U.S. production today is governed in large part by a lot of smaller oil companies that are now better able than they've ever been to turn off production and to turn back on production very quickly. These decisions, these changes in oil production happen much more quickly in this country than they used to, which means as the oil price drifts further north toward $40, 45 if it gets into the 50s, then more production will come back online pretty quickly in the US to take advantage of the higher price. The Saudis know this. I've been doing speeches like this for more than a decade now. And it used to be that when we talked about oil prices, the question was always, when are the Saudis going to cut? OPEC will get together in Vienna. They'll have a meeting. All the OPEC countries will agree to cut. Everybody else except Saudi Arabia will cheat. They'll say they're going to cut, and they won't, but the Saudis will cut. Markets will respond to that signal. The Saudis do not have that option in 2016. Why? Because they know that if they cut in a world where the US can quickly ramp up production, Iran is producing more, Iraq is producing more, demand is slowing. If the Saudis cut, they know very well that what they're really cutting is their own market share. They're not really adding meaningful upward pressure on the price because more supply will come online. And at the end of the day, the Saudis will have lost market share. And they cannot afford to do that. Not in a world in which their major regional rival, Iran, is producing oil and the balance of power is shifting in the Middle East as a result. So you are going to read in the newspaper comments where Saudi oil minister, Iran oil minister, Russian government officials are talking about getting together and coordinating on a cut. Number one, that's not going to happen. Number two, even if they announce that they're going to do it, it's not going to happen because these three governments really don't trust each other and none of them is interested in losing their market share in a world where they are all concerned about their own individual economic futures. So this is the world of oil. Now, Looking around the world beyond, you know, beyond the Middle East, what this means is that a lot of the work that we're doing this year at Eurasia Group is helping our clients understand market by market, producers and consumers, how are they responding to the lower oil price? So there's a lot of people who are saying, boy, Russia's in real trouble. Russia's in real trouble. Over the longer term, yes, Russia is in real trouble. But for now, Russia probably has what it needs to weather lower oil prices, at least for 2016. In large part because President Putin has an 82% approval rating. He doesn't really have to worry about a challenge on the streets. There is no alternative party waiting to take advantage of political weakness in government in Russia. They still have plenty of reserves. The ruble is floating, which allows them to absorb some of the damage from the higher price, etc. Make no mistake, over time the Russians are going to have trouble, but probably not so much in 2016. The Saudis, who I'm going to talk about later in more depth, 
The Saudis also have $600 billion plus in reserves. They're okay for now, but they're also planning for a long-term future. The one country in the world that is a major energy producer that has really got to be worried about where 2016 is going is Venezuela. 